Uh, we move now to our fourth paper from Wang Lung Ting. You are unmuted, the impact of virtual arrangements on legislators' participation during the COVID pandemic, which actually follows on very nicely from what Alex was saying. So take it away, Kiwi. Thanks, Alex. Uh, I was just going to say that I'm really glad I'm following the wonderful presentation by Alex, because not least because it saved me a little bit of time to talk about the context of the uh, virtual proceedings. So um, my paper is I actually presented in the DSA conference in March, and I also written a blog post for the parliamentary group blog uh, in May on this. So this is building up on some of the preliminary findings that I presented earlier in the year. Oops. Yeah, so I think uh, these are some familiar scenes that we have been uh, used to for the last uh, year and a half. That's, we are seeing uh, MPs across uh, in, uh, in different parliaments across the world are participating in parliamentary uh, proceeding virtually. So we see uh, on the left is the British House of Commons and on the right is the Canadian House of Commons. So what I want to do in this paper, uh, yeah, what I want to do in this paper is to look at whether uh, the virtual arrangement affect the participation or the extended participation between different MPs. Because when virtual arrangement was first introduced to Parliament across the world, it was used as an emergency measure during the pandemic. First of all, is to ensure that uh, there's social distancing during the pandemic. Parliamentary buildings in the world are not designed with that in mind. And so it's necessary for Parliament to adopt this uh, virtual arrangement. And secondly, it's also to some extent to maintain the representativeness of the parliament by ensuring and facilitating participation by MPs who are adversely affected by the pandemic, not least the elderly MPs who are more likely to be infected because of the health concern, and also women MPs who are more likely to uh, be uh, burdened by increased caring and familial responsibility during the pandemic. So I think the research question that I want to answer is, first of all, did virtual arrangement increase participation among elderly and women MPs? And secondly, to what extent are these benefits comes from mitigating or reversing the adverse effect of the pandemic during the last year? And also, uh, maybe the uh, finding could give us some insight as to whether Parliament should retain some forms of virtual arrangement when we move past beyond the pandemic, because it's quite a controversial issue about whether Parliament in the long run should adopt some forms of virtual uh, procedures. So uh, these are some of the things that we want to achieve in this paper. So who would benefit from uh, a higher proceeding or a virtual proceeding in Parliament? First of all, as I said earlier, the most obvious beneficiary would be the older elderly MPs because they need to be shielded uh, during, uh, uh, during the pandemic because of their health concern. So they are less able to physically attend proceeding in Parliament. So arguably, uh, virtual arrangement should benefit the uh, participation from elderly MPs by encouraging them to be more participatory during the pandemic. Secondly, it's about, uh, it, it was also benefit women MPs because of the traditional gender role, meaning that women are more likely to be adversely affected by the increased domestic responsibility during the pandemic. Schools are closed, uh, children need to stay at home, and women MPs are more likely to, to be ticking up on those responsibilities of taking care of families and their children at home. And therefore, it might uh, prevent them from being as active uh, if parliamentary procedures are still conducted physically in the parliamentary building. And so this tension between professional and domestic responsibility has long been hypothesized in the literature about legislative uh, participation by women. But uh, uh, so I want to build up on those findings of previous study and see whether uh, virtual proceeding can, in a way, uh, facilitate women participation, not merely during the pandemic, but also in the long run by reducing this pressure on women MPs. So uh, a little bit of context about how the proceeding, although uh, Alex already uh, kind of covered a lot about this. So during the pandemic, M uh, British MPs may choose to participate virtually or uh, physically uh, in parliamentary proceeding. MPs who want to participate virtually can submit an intention to speak uh, virtually, 
and then they put on the call list and then they would be uh, called up on by the clerks uh, by Zoom to uh, participate in the parliamentary discussion. I think the uh, reason why the hybrid proceeding in the UK House of Commons is such an intriguing case is because uh, hybrid proceeding in the House of Commons has actually gone through several phases of expansion and contraction throughout the years. So uh, as you see in the table at the bottom of the slides, during the first phase of the uh, hybrid proceeding uh, in the peak of infection, uh, the first wave in uh, spring 2020, uh, MPs can participate virtually in uh, almost all parliamentary business, but also scrutiny and substantive business. And also all MPs can participate virtually with no questions asked. But then as the first wave subside and the number of infections dropped in last summer, the application of hybrid proceeding actually contracted to limit it to only scrutiny business only, which means that MPs can only virtually participate in uh, ministerial question time and also in ministerial statement but they cannot participate virtually in what we call substantive business, which is discussion about legislation. And also MP only needs to self-certify as eligible because of the age or because of other consideration. So there's a significant contraction of the application of pilot proceeding uh, during the summer and uh, autumn of 2020. But then as we experience a second or third wave uh, after last Christmas, uh, it's uh, Parliament basically expanded the application of hybrid proceeding again because of the pressure from the pandemic, and so we see that there is a different phases of the application of hybrid proceeding, and the importance of these phases would be clear uh, once I move on to the next slide. So the data I use to analyze how hybrid proceeding affect MPs participation is by looking at uh, the, uh, the all entries in Hansard since 2019 January election up until the middle of March this year. All and as are only con a conducted amount uh, backbench MP because uh, for French MPs, their participation is less of their own initiatives, but more uh, uh, because of the front bench role that they play in parliament. So I only focus my attention on backbench MP. And the main determinant variable I look at is the number of words spoken by each MP during each week. So I track how they the amount of words is spoke uh, between different weeks throughout the entire year. So the research design that I have is a difference in different research style. So I look at the difference of MP participation between the more expansion, expansive application of hard proceeding during the phase one and phase three, and compare that uh, with the more restricted uh, uh, phase uh, during the last summer and autumn. The reason I use this design is because Ideally, if we want to look at the impact of hybrid proceeding, we want to look at counterfactual where uh, hybrid proceeding doesn't exist. But we obviously cannot observe this uh, counterfactual where hybrid proceeding wasn't adopted while the pandemic is still going on. So what we can do is to think of the expansion of application of hybrid proceeding during phase one and phase three as sort of treatment. If we expand the application of hybrid proceeding, does that increase the amount of words spoken? by women MP or by elderly MPs. So these are the hypotheses that I will test. First, are age MP more active during phase one and phase three in comparison to phase two? And secondly, does the severity of the pandemic negatively relate to the participation in parliament proceeding by older MPs during phase two, but less so during phase one and phase three? So I, uh, I also apply these two hypotheses to women MP and I want to test whether MPs, first of all, are speaking more in phase one and phase three in comparison to phase two. And secondly, whether this benefit stems from mitigating the negative impact or the severity of the pandemic. So the first set of model I look at is basically a triple interaction between the phase, the, uh, uh, the age of MP, and also the gender of the MP. So I also add a uh, width fixed effect and MP fixed effects to uh, basically focus the attention on within MP difference uh, between the, the in, uh, between different phases. So, so the results that I found is that, uh, first of all, women are indeed speaking more during phase one and phase three in comparison to phase two, but less so for older MPs. Older MPs are not necessarily speaking more during phase one, but they are speaking more in phase three. 
but I think there's also an interaction between women and elderly. So older women, this, there's a compound effect between gender and age as well. Older women have a particularly intense effect uh, for both phase one and phase three. So this gives us some uh, evidence that if we expand the application of hybrid proceeding, women are indeed going to speak more. But uh, the result for older MPs uh, seems to be a little bit um, ambiguous, let's say. And I also try to combine uh, phase one and phase three into this, uh, uh, the same analysis because the uh, application of hyper proceeding in phase one and phase three are virtually the same. So uh, uh, in, in the second model in the right, I try to consider both phrases as, as the same phrases. And we see that uh, the result is consistent with what we found in the first model where women are indeed speaking more and especially so for elderly women, for uh, elderly MPs in general, the result is again a little bit ambiguous. Secondly, I want to see if the benefits to women and maybe to elderly MPs stems from uh, hyper proceeding reducing the adverse effect of the COVID pandemic. So what I do here is, again, it's a triple interaction, but it's interaction between the phases of the week, the characteristic of MP, and the weekly COVID death of that week. So basically what I want to see is if there are more death in uh, more death from COVID in general in the UK, which means that the pandemic is, uh, uh, is more severe in the, uh, in, in the UK. Does that negatively affect the uh, uh, participation of MPs in the first place? But secondly, does the expansion of uh, uh, proceeding in phase one and phase three reduce the adverse effect of the severity of the pandemic on participation from women and from older MPs. So what we found here is, first of all, for older MPs, we see that, first of all, uh, the severity of, of uh, the, uh, the COVID pandemic do indeed have a negative impact on participation uh, by MPs in general. The more deaths there are in the UK from COVID, the less words spoken by MPs in general. But for elderly MPs, the phrase doesn't seem to change this negative effect uh, that stems from the severity of the COVID pandemic, regardless of whether I considered phase one and phase three separately or together. But I think most interesting is when we look at how it affects women MP. So if you look at the model from on the right, you see that actually the severity of COVID pandemic doesn't impact or doesn't have a very significant negative impact on men's uh, participation in parliamentary proceedings, but it does have a negative impact on women participation in parliamentary proceedings. The estimation here is that every 1,000 death of uh, uh, COVID, uh, 1,000 death contributed by COVID in the week during the pandemic uh, uh, is associated with 11% of drop of a number of words spoken by women in a week. But more, but more is, most interestingly is this effect is only confined in the second phrases where the hyper proceeding, um, uh, the, the application of hyper proceeding are more contracted because in phase one and phase three, the 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 the, the, the effect the negative effect that comes from COVID pandemic for women virtually gone, and it's the same if we consider both phase one and phase three together. So it's a strong evidence to show us how hyper proceeding is indeed reducing the impact of uh, uh, negative impact of uh, the COVID pandemic on women's participation in parliamentary proceeding. So the conclusion from these um, findings is that there seems to be a strong evidence to suggest that virtual arrangement has increased women anti participation. Women do speak more in phrase one and phrase three in comparison to phrase two as hypothesized, and also the severity of pandemic seems to only adversely affect participation by women in phase two, but not in phase one and phase three. For elderly, the elderly MP, the evidence is a bit weaker because it seems to be only have an effect on phase three only. And I think the pattern of participation is better explained by how if elderly MP might have a steeper learning curve in adopting to new technology amount uh, 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 in Parliament. So I think this might be a case to retain virtual arrangement uh, post pandemic because First of all, it does seem that virtual, virtual proceeding do facilitate MP, uh, women MP participation, even though it's only mitigating the adverse impact from COVID. But I think if we think about COVID as uh, 
a, uh, a if you think about the impact of COVID as increasing the, uh, the, the domestic uh, responsibility of women MP, it can happen to uh, women MP as, as male MP even beyond pandemic time because of uh, well, uh, sickness in the family or some family tragedy. And so there might be a case to apply virtual proceeding uh, for MP on a case-to-case -case basis based on the circumstances and what a domestic uh, or caring responsibility is adversely affecting the uh, 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 responsibility of specific MPs. So moving forward, there are also some things that's wanted to do later on to try to control for MPs uh, familiar circumstances and uh, also to look at the content of MPs uh, participation and see if virtual participation uh, changed the, uh, the, the way that MP speaks and also how it affects the deliberation in a particular debate. So uh, that's all for my presentation, and I hopefully uh, I will uh, uh, hear from you in the Q and A. Mm -hmm.